Hello. Hello. Hi. Hi. I can see you. Can you see me? Yes, we are live this morning. We seem to have had a little technical hitch. Good morning, Tanya. Good morning. Hi, Carl. Hi, good morning. Chris, I can't see you yet. We are live on the forum. We just had a little technical hitch this morning, it seems. Can you hear me, Tanya? I can hear you, Chris, but I can't see you. Hmm. Um, oh, my goodness. How about now? Oh, there we go, Chris. Hi, Chris. Welcome, everybody. Morning, Happy New Year to the expert legal team. <laughs> It's Friday, so it must be Friday Facebook Live with Tanya Friedman and the expert legal team. Jacob Sapachnik was having a little bit of a, a technical issue, but hopefully he will join us soon. We are live on the forum this morning. Um, so Happy New Year to everybody. Um, my name is Tanya Friedman. I'm the Chief Operating Officer of Kinetics. We are a direct hire company. We specialize in bringing international nurses to hospitals, long-term care, rehab, surgery centers all over the US. And I have with me Carl Schusterman and Chris Marcello. Um, usually I will uh, introduce Carl and Chris, but I think everybody in the forum knows them right now. Um, but Carl or Chris, do you wanna just maybe do a brief introduction on your background? Um, and then we can get started on the questions. Um, well, yeah, go ahead, Carl. Been, I'm old. I've been doing immigration <laughs> law. For You're not years. old, Carl. Don't well, say I, that. I, I've been doing immigration law for over 40 years. And I, I worked for the Immigration Service. I was a prosecutor. And then I came in from the dark side. And I have been helping nurses for the last 30-something years. I think we've immigrated at least 10,000 nurses to the US. And my wife is a Filipino from Cebu. So uh, I, uh, I welcome you all to the, uh, you know, to fulfill your dreams of coming into the US. Thank you, Carl and Chris. Right, so uh, yeah, so I've known both uh, Tanya and Carl for probably 15 or, or 20 years. I've been, uh, <laughs> I've been practicing in uh, in in healthcare immigration for uh, since the 1990s, and uh, you know, Carl and I, in terms of the legal team, were two of the pioneers. I mean, I, I remember, must be almost 15 years ago, Carl and I were speaking at the American Immigration Lawyers Conference, mentoring other attorneys on um, on healthcare uh, immigration. So this is uh, you know, this is a big part of my practice. I know it's a big part of Carl's practice, and we always look forward to Tanya. Uh, inviting us to do these sessions. Thank you, Chris. And thank you, Carl and Chris, for, for being on the panel because I know how busy you are. And this year, I think it's only going to get busier, which is good news for everybody on the panel and everybody watching. I want to welcome everybody who's joining us today. So we have um, Crystal Thomas watching from Singapore. Happy New Year, Crystal. Um, Asel Blessy, Marian Gomez are watching. And um, Blessy's watching from Olin. How, how are you, Blessy? Nice to, to see you, Milanis. So we have a lot of people joining in. Please let us know where you are watching from. We want to welcome everybody today. Please share your questions. Um, I have a lot of questions that Louise has posted and uh, that some of you have sent to me. Um, the reason why we do these panels every month, so every month we will continue to do it in the, in the new year, 2020. But the reason why we do this is because, well, first of all, from my side, I was an immigrant myself. I came to the US uh, over 20 years ago. And I can tell you from personal experience, it was one of the most scary and stressful experiences I've ever encountered in my life. Um, so I really can identify with so many of you that are watching. Um, and for a long time, I used to watch people in the fora ask each other questions. And it kind of broke my heart because I was like, I know how scary and stressful this can be. Um, and, you know, none of you are lawyers or, or, or you know, there, there, there isn't an, a legal expert team that is here to help you. So this is the reason why we do this once a month forum to help you to share information, give you a chance to answer, get your questions answered by experts who know what they're talking about and specialize in nurse recruitment. 
So we've got, oh, we're welcoming more people. Hamish is in Sydney. Oh, Hamish, I was just in Sydney recently. And a shout out to everybody in, in Australia with the, these awful fires. We're thinking of you. And um, Renelle is watching. Barbie's from the Philippines. May from Saudi Arabia. Cyrus is higher. Higher, Cyrus. And um, Leah from Singapore. Jean is watching. And thank you again to the Lafora admin team. Um, Louise, Jean, Paul, etc., for giving us this opportunity, and um, you really are doing such a wonderful service for so many people. So let's get started. The first question that we have is from Jose Reyes, who asked, I'm already done with my DS260, and I've received a letter from the NBC stating that I'm DQ, documentary qualified. I'm just waiting for my PD to be current to have my embassy interview here in Manila. My question is, can I have my case transferred to the US Embassy in London, even though I'm already DQ because I'm planning to work there while waiting for my PD to be current? Carl, do you want to take that first question from Jose? Right, well, you can, Jose, you can transfer it from uh, one embassy to another one. The, the only problem is timing. Um, you know, in this particular administration, everything's taking longer to uh, get an interview. So if your priority date is <clears throat> a few months away, it probably won't uh, delay anything. But if your priority date is coming up in the next couple of months, you may want to go to Manila because it, it'll just be faster. Okay. So Jose, you don't tell us exactly when your priority date is, but there's the answer to your question. And I know so many of you are so anxious to get here. So, um, you know, you've got to evaluate that very carefully. We have a question from, um, it's, a, it's a confidential question that Louise has posted. Thank you, Louise. Um, I just got my priority date approval and recently received my NBC feeble. My priority date is June 2019, which is I'm not yet current on in both tables. My question is, is it okay to start paying now my NBC feeble and start to do my DS260 even I'm so far away to be current in both tables? Is there any chance to be document qualified later on, um, also even not yet current? Chris. Yes, so we generally recommend that you go ahead and continue through with the process with the document qualifications and with the fee bills. Now I'm assuming that you're Philippine EB3 because you said you're not current. The Philippine number is uh, I think March of 18. So if you're June of 19, that is uh, you know a year and uh, a few months difference i'm maybe I, I think i'm more optimistic than what the visa bulletin is printing based on the numbers we track internally here i'm also a little more optimistic because historically the nbc only wants to begin their process if they're confident that the, that the visa is going to be issued soon uh so uh, I, I think there's actually a chance that if you move through the process that this summer if uh, that, that they accelerate the priority dates quite a bit, whether they get to June 2019, that, that may be a bit optimistic. But uh, to answer the question, I, I think I would still progress through with the process. The only reason not to do it is, of course, there's the risk that circumstances changes and you don't wanna come to the US by the time your interview is. And so from that standpoint, if you wanted to wait a few months um, I think that's okay, but just keep an eye on the visa bulletin. And if you see the visa bulletin start to move, which it might in the April, May, June timeframe, then I think you're going to want to make sure that, that you're moving through the process with the female family. Okay. So that's really great advice, um, Chris. Um, and, and interesting, well, just reading the way that I'm not sure who, uh, you know, this is a confidential uh, request, but it seems that um, whoever this is, is very anxious to get here. So I, I don't get the feeling that they're going to be changing their mind in any way. Um, Chris and Carl, do you want to maybe speak a little bit about the visa bulletin? Because I know that's a question that comes up every month. And um, people have been a little bit disappointed by the slow movement. Chris, we're excited to hear that maybe you're a little bit more positive about that. Do you want to maybe just give a little bit of comment or your thoughts in that regard? Sure, yeah. I mean, the reason I'm a little more optimistic is because uh, we track some of the numbers internally here, and we just don't see the visas being used at the rate that the Department of State 
seems to indicate uh, for the Philippine EB3. Now, I've got to be honest, a part of the reason that I think the Department of State has retrogressed uh, all the numbers, and in fact, we're expecting a worldwide EB3 retrogression maybe in March or so, uh, based again, not, not anything internally we're tracking, just off what we're seeing from the visa bulletin comments. Uh, but um, the, the real sort of issue, I think, is that some of the other categories like EB1 and EB2 are probably using more visas than they have historically used, which means fewer visas are, are, visas are flowing down into EB3. H having said all that, about 85 or so percent of all the green cards, employment-based green cards, are actually issued here in the United States through a process called adjustment of status. And, and, and Carl can, can, can maybe offer his thoughts as well. But internally, we're not seeing those cases move at all quickly. And in fact, they're, they're quite slowing down. And so uh, the USCIS, which handles those 85% adjustments of status, do not seem to be moving those cases very quickly, which means theoretically there should be a lot more visas freed up for, uh, for uh, the consular process cases, which would be a visa in embassy interview in London, Manila, uh, UAE, et cetera. So for all of those reasons, we're a little more optimistic than some of the um, chatter has been, but I don't want to overstate it because, of course, the Department of State, you know, they, they, they seem to be pretty conservative in how they're, how they're um, releasing the visas. I, I, I do agree with uh, Chris. I think those are, are, are very good comments. Um, just, just a little backup for, you know, those of you who are unfamiliar uh, with how the process works. There is only 100 uh, out of the million people who immigrate to the US every year, there's only 140,000, so less than 15% who come in through employment. And of those 140,000, they include the person's spouse and the person's kids. So really we're talking about maybe 80,000 people that are coming in through their jobs. Now, add, added to that, there are per country quotas. So no country can get more than 7% of the worldwide total. Uh, so people who live in uh, most of the countries in the world, uh, there's no backup that it's current. And as Chris said, it's probably gonna back up in the future though. Um, but certain countries, India, China, and the Philippines, uh, there's so many skilled people that are coming to the US through their jobs, that that's why there is a backlog. And you know, looking ahead for nurses, by 2021, there's supposed to be a million vacant nurse jobs, unfilled nurse jobs in the United States. Um, and I know Chris and I are you know, trying to get a hundreds and hundreds of nurses from other countries to the United States, but the more the hospitals and healthcare providers come to us and ask for more nurses, the more likely that there'll be backlogs in, in the future. And the Philippines is, uh, I, I don't let Chris talk about this, but I mean, for us, 90% of the nurses that we bring to the US are born in the Philippines. So that 7% per country backlog in, in the, maybe not in the next few months, but in the next couple of years, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll probably keep backlogging. So e either Congress is gonna have to do something because we had such a shortage or there's gonna be tremendous backlogs. Yeah, yeah. And, and I, can, I can speak for everybody on the panel. We've all been doing this a very, very long time and we have never seen the demand the way that it is right now. So we have, I mean, we have hospitals, long-term care, rehab facilities, surgery centers, right across the board, now looking at international nurses to supplement their current recruitment of American nurses because they just don't have enough supply. And it's not like anyone could say this time next year, something's going to happen and it's going to get better. It's only going to get worse. So in actual fact, that's, you know, that's good news for everybody who's, who's listening um, and who wants to come to the U.S. So moving back to the questions, um, we've got Ranel asked a question into the chat. Um, Ms. Tanya, I have a friend who was not able to get a police clearance in UAE and is now in the Philippines. And when he checked the ref 
the reciprocity is waived. Would that affect his EB3 application, Chris? Yeah, I, I would. The first question I would ask is why wasn't he able to get the police clearance? Uh, normally, you do need yeah. the police clearance. If it's because he was out of the country, um, sometimes that will be waived and the embassy will still issue the visa. Okay. Um, Jean said she's watching, but she's too sleepy now. Go sleep, Jean. You work very hard. <laughs> um, Drew Condi has asked, I just wanted to ask if it's possible to fly to the U.S. from the Philippines. Even our EB3 visa was processed and issued in the UAE. Our child was born after the issuance of the EB3 visa. Is it possible to accompany him on our first entry to the U.S.? If not, what would be... Uh, what would be the visa option for him? Should it also be processed in the UAE or could it be processed in the Philippines? Carl. Well, the, yeah, your, your child will have to get the EB3 visa in order to come to the US. It can't just come any other way. Uh, I, I would think that processing times, if, if you got your visa in the UAE and that's where you are now, <clears throat> you'd want to contact the embassy there and tell them you have a child and, uh, and get the green card through the UA, the U.S. embassy there and come to the U.S. Okay. And um, so there you go, Drew. Um, Donna is asking, hi, Donna. I know Donna. Uh, hi, everybody watching from the UAE. I'm already DQ, but my priority date is not yet current. However, my children and my husband are follow to join. Their visa, their, their visa fee bill was issued in April 2019. My case manager told me that my family should be in the U.S. before April 2020. What shall I do? I'm still waiting for my priority date to be current. What will happen to their visa fee bill? Will it be canceled? Thank you for response and more power. Chris. Um, yeah, I, I just, uh, I missed a factor two there. So yeah. She is waiting for her priority date to become current. And then she said her family, her spouse, and, and maybe children follow. are followed to join. And are they followed to join because they're going to be in a different country? Did she explain that there? It's not in the chat. Um, Don, if you want to maybe send some additional information, and I'll, we'll try to get your question in um, so that Chris can answer that for you. Um, we have, wow, the questions are coming fast and furious. Thank you, everybody, for sending your question. We will try to get through as many as possible for you. Marion Neal asked, will I be able to still visit the U.S. with a tourist visa? Even I have a pending EB-3. Will it be canceled or not? That, it, you know, it's very unlikely to be able to come to the U.S. with a tourist visa when you have a, a green card application pending particularly if the priority date is, um, <clears throat> is you know, in the short term, because for a tourist visa, you have to show that you have no intention of remaining permanently in the US. And by, by being sponsored for a green card, obviously you do want to stay permanently. So the only way around that is that if you have, you know, a round trip ticket, uh, maybe some relative has a health issue or something like that, uh, where you can show them that you're going to go back to the job and come later on the EB-3, but it's very difficult. I used to think it was almost impossible, but I know my wife in the 1970s, when she got her citizenship, she applied for her eight brothers and sisters. And that, that is, uh, I mean, if you think that it's a uh, waiting time for EB-3, Think about this, to get a brother or sister from the Philippines is 23 years, wow. okay? And wow. so her sister uh, wanted to come on a visitor's visa and I was really skeptical about it, but because she was about 20 years away from a green card and had a round trip <laughs> ticket, the, the guy at the airport said, no problem. We And, and her family stayed in the <laughs> Philippines while this was going on. So she wow. visited us regularly then Oh, really? So, so, but, you know, for an EB3, we're, you know, we're talking about less than two years. I really doubt that they'll let you in on a visitor's visa. Yeah. It, it'd probably be at the office's discretion, right? Well, yeah, it's always at their discretion. And that's uh, under the particular administration we're under, they, they tend to be rougher at the airports than easier. Yeah. So, uh, Marion, I hope that that helps you. Um, 
Louise is watching. Hi, Louise. Welcome. Thank you for all you do for so many nurses. You provide such an amazing service and, and such great information. Um, Marian Nell said, thank you for answering the questions. Um, Lenscraft, hi, Ren Renante is watching. I well, know Renante. Mac is watching. Hi, Mac. Nina, Re Nina is watching. Hi, Nina. Um, so Ma'am Dai asked, can EB3 application have an impact on the Canadian um, uh, PR application? Chris. Uh, so I've got to give one caveat, which is I don't practice Canadian law. So I can't say for certain, but ha having said that, I have never heard of an American green card petition, EB3 petition, having any negative consequence on a Canadian uh, permanent residency uh, petition. So I, I think you'll probably be fine. Okay. Yeah, I, I, I would probably, I mean, I'm not, I'm not a lawyer. I, I feel sometimes I could be a lawyer, <laughs> um, but we have, we bring through thousands of Canadians every day to the U.S. and I've never heard of that having an impact either. Um, so Chris Borger asked, um, hi, Ms. Tanya, I have a question regarding our status after the embassy interview. Lately, it seems that less people are getting approved and many are getting um, uh, um, 221G status. So far, none have been approved, but only very few are approved. Are there any updates on why this is happening? I have a little information on this. Okay. Yeah, we have heard uh, or seen over the last maybe three or four weeks, many immigrant visa petitions get a 221G at the Manila Embassy in particular. Uh, and there's essentially two reasons that I can tell that are causing this both of which I think will probably be solved in the next few weeks. Uh, one of which is there's been some turnover in, um, in the immigrant visa desk. In fact, there's not a head of the immigrant visa desk in Manila right now. And so hopefully uh, once they get uh, it staffed properly, that will help on, on, on one hand. And then the second is there seems to be a misunderstanding of two issues at the embassy that I know our office is working a little bit to try and educate them on it, but sometimes that takes a little while. And the two issues are about US employment contracts and about whether an employer's offer letter has to list the wage that was issued on the I-140, which is often 2017, or some sort of updated wage. And while most employers will pay a a current wage by law, they only have to list the earlier wage. And so what we usually advise the employers is to have the wage on the offer letter match the I-140 because that's what the law says. And so anyway, so those are the two technical reasons that I think are going on. And then you layer on top of it, a bit of a staffing and training issue at the immigrant visa desk. And so I think that's what's causing the 221 Gs over the last few weeks. I'm somewhat optimistic that that will get fixed in the next few weeks. So. That's really good news, Chris. And thanks for that um, insider insight, um, which I think is really helpful for a lot of people who are watching to know. Um, I have got, well, I've got, we've got so many questions. I haven't even got to the questions that were sent to us previously. So I'm trying to get through as many as we can. Um, let me just see. Um, okay, Christelle is asked. Oh, Christelle asked about the visa bulletin. So, Christelle, we I think we've already covered that question for you. And then March, what Thenma is watching from the Philippines. Hi, Thenma. Um, okay. Um, I think Mayam, we've answered your question. Mark. Um, hi, Mark is asking. Delighted to tune into this. Live information forum for 2020. Kudos for the momentum and continuing of spreading immigration knowledge. Thank you, Mark. We will continue to do our best to help. Um, Renell asked, um, oh, Renell was giving us information. That was the, the question before, Chris, um, that the person came back because of, of an emergency situation um, and he was not able to go back to the UAE. The spouse was not able to go back to yeah. the UAE. Yes, correct. Yeah, so I mean, the way that process would work then is that the nurse who is in the UAE, when when she becomes current, and I'm, 
my memory's getting bad as I get older, but I think she said she's still quite a bit of ways from her priority date. Yes, I think uh, so. I, the first thing I'd probably do is, you know, reevaluate re when it becomes time for the interview, because if she can keep her interview together with the family in the UAE, that, that's always our first choice. As Carl was saying earlier, it's not that you can't move the embassy um, appointments, but, but sometimes it does slow the process down. Anyway, so, so the first choice is try and just have the family go wherever they were initially um, registered. But if they're going to be split, then once she gets her visa, then the spouse and children can file a follow to join at the embassy in Manila. And, and that'll take a number of months, but, but it, it tends to work. You know, they're very familiar with it at the embassy there, so it should work fine. Okay, good. So there you go, Renell. And um, Kay is watching. I know Kay. Hi, Kay. Oh, oh, Julie. Hi, Julie. Nice to see everybody here. Um, Drew asked a follow-up question. Thank you, follow-up question. Is it possible to fly to the U.S. from the Philippines even our EB-3 was processed and issued in the UAE? So that's a question we often get, Carl. I, I'm I'm sorry. I don't I, I don't know whether I understood that question. I, I think what Drew was saying is that um, the EB3 was processed in the UAE, but he wants to fly to the US from the Philippines. Oh well, yeah. If the, if if your immigrant visa application was uh, granted at at any US embassy, UAE or wherever it was, it. Uh, you you have actually 180 days to come to the U.S. So you, you could go on a round the world tour and still come to the U.S. So, okay. so the answer is yes, you can. So the answer is yes, true. Um, and Julie asked a question. Um, so Julie is, is, is one of our kinetics nurses. Um, and the question is, she's been interviewed in the Fresno USCIS with her family, but because of retrogression, they've transferred the case to the Texas service center is this a good thing well it's not necessarily you know it's not necessarily good or bad i mean it's just uh if they uh if it's retrogress she just has to wait for the the date to become current to get her green card not, nothing to worry about nothing to worry about so judy try not to worry i know that it's a very stressful process um but i know that you are in good hands um, Arlen has asked, oh my goodness, we are almost out of time. I'm here in Kuwait, nurse specialist for 18 years and going to be 46 years old this year. Do I have a chance to apply in the US? I plan to take the NCLEX this year. Chris. Well, first of all, you're very young, so I wouldn't worry. <laughs> I agree that. with that, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but yeah, no, by all means, I don't see why you can't apply for the NCLEX and, and get your visa and come to the U.S. As, as uh, you know, as we've been saying this morning, there's probably never been more demand in all the years that we've all been in this business for uh, Philippine nurses here in America. So yeah, please pursue it. Pursue your dream. Yeah. In fact, Alan, I would strongly suggest that you take your NCLEX as soon as possible. There's never been a better time in many, many years to come to the US and start this process. So really get that NCLEX as soon as possible. We have many clients that are looking for nurses um, and um, go ahead and, 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 um, and get started. Um, okay, I think this will be our last question. Um, so Amy Coles is asking for a friend, how to determine if your employer abandoned you? Is there a specific span of waiting? Mm -hmm. To that question. When, when they say abandoned, did they mean, I'm not sure what part of the process I'm they were sure. in. Yeah. Uh, sometimes, sometimes employers will, uh, well, maybe one thing, it, it might, uh, I don't know if it's exactly her question, but might might be a good thing to close on. Um, if, if the employers already filed the petition, and let's say the petition got approved, and now your employer doesn't want to sponsor you anymore, uh, it's bad, but it's good in a way because if the, the date that the petition was approved for you is your place in line, we call that your priority date. So if you do find out that your employer is, is you know, call them up and find out whether they're still sponsoring you. But if they're not, you can get a new employer and use that first priority date. So it may actually be a blessing in disguise. Yeah. And the thing, Amy, is, as we say on this panel often, 
Um, you've heard the panelists say it, and I've said it many times, always be ethical. It's really important that you res you are respectful of your of the employer. If you if you get an offer, take your time, evaluate that offer, make sure you understand everything. It's a serious action to sign up with a, with an employer, and it's important to be ethical in your in your dealings with that employer. So if they have abandoned you, make sure that you get a release letter so that you can move forward, as Carl said, and maybe get somebody else to recapture the priority date. Um, so I'm going to take the one last question, and I'm so sorry, everybody. We, I'm going to try and get um, as many of your questions answered in the next session as well. We have a question from Michael who asked, is it more practical to take U.S. visa or proceed to IELTS? Um, oh, and there seems to be a follow-up question. What is more practical, proceed to visa application priority date or have my IELTS first? Um, Chris, do you want to take that question? I'm not. Yeah, no, I know. I think I get what, what the question yeah. is driving at. So yes, yeah. you want to do. First of all, it's not an either or. This isn't a choice. But I think what the uh, question is aiming at is: Should I take my IELTS now, or should I wait until my priority date is current? And the answer is absolutely take your IELTS now. First of all, the IELTS is a difficult exam, and while most people pass, sometimes it takes one or two or three times. So definitely take the IELTS. And the second reason is once you pass the IELTS, that does not in and of itself allow you to get the visa. You actually have to go through a process called the visa screen. And uh, Tanya, I think you may even have a video or um, a posting on this that I'm going to suggest that, that everyone looks for the kinetics uh, video on it. But the basic idea is that your IELTS along with your educational documents um, will get sent to CGFNS uh, which is an organization here in the U.S., and they take sometimes as many as three or four months to process all that. And so I would hate for your priority date to become current, and then you take the IELTS, and then that takes a month or two to pass, and then it goes to CGFNS, and that takes two or three or four months, and all of a sudden you could have been in America as much as six months sooner than if you'd just taken the IELTS and gotten that process started. Keep in mind, once you do the IELTS and submit it to CGFNS, when they issue that visa screen, it's valid for five years. And so the idea of your visa screen lapsing is pretty remote. So uh, so to answer the question, yes, go ahead and take that IELTS even if you're not current. Yeah, I, I would agree. And I'm sh Carl, I'm sure you would agree with that 100%. I do. The IELTS for, for a lot of nurses is actually seems to be more scary um, and more stressful than even taking the NCLEX exam. Um, but it's, I mean, no IELTS, no USA. So it really is essential to get that as soon as possible. And as Chris said, many nurses don't pass it the first time. And um, I would strongly encourage you also to join Kinetics, have a free IELTS support group. It's totally free to you. We post materials um, from one of the most reputable companies um, in, in, the, in the world. Um, who are a UK company and um, the UK criteria for IELTS is higher than that for coming to the US and that's the reason why we chose to partner with Swoosh um, and uh, so please feel free to join the, the free Kinetics IELTS support group. We can put you together with st study partners. There's a lot of materials there that's totally free. It's our service to you to help you to pass that exam but as Chris said and I know Carl you agree 100% get that IELTS done because that is a big worry. And until you've got that, you really can't sleep easy. Okay, well, we have a lot more people that have joined and have posted questions. We will try and make sure to get through as many of your questions before, but we, as, as many as we can going forward. Um, but um, we want, I want to thank the panel, Carl and Chris. Uh, I think uh, Jacob had some technical hitches this morning, so we look forward to him joining us again um, next time. We will be doing these Facebook reviews, as, you, as everybody knows, once a month. Louise will be posting the next date. Please share this, this Facebook Live session with your friends and colleagues because we want to get the information out. Continue to send your questions. And we are excited for 2020, and we look forward to seeing many of you in the U.S. soon. Thank you, everybody. Bye -bye. Have a great Thank weekend. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.